Thanks, Andy and John. What a great introduction. Nothing like a little ACDC at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Get your blood flowing. All right. Uh, members of NDTA, Transcom, teammates, members of our components, and of course, representatives from our commercial partners. I happily join the president and the chairman here with you uh, at wonderful Union Station, downtown St. Louis. Let me start by adding my appreciation for the combined NDTA and Transcom team for their incredible efforts in getting us all together in this amazing venue. Thank you to everyone who put so much time and effort into this fantastic event. A little round of applause. This year's fall meeting has already generated some important conversations and with major topics like China's implications for the United States, our national defense strategy, and cybersecurity, I expect it's only going to get better. This year's theme of evolving the strategic advantage is well-timed, and I cannot overemphasize the need for our organizations to rapidly adapt to the realities of strategic competition. We need you with us all the way. Now, it's hard to believe a year has passed since I took command, standing in front of you at National Harbor last year. We had just completed the largest non-combatant evacuation in history. Today, our logistical prowess remains on full display as we balance the rigors of our global mission while ensuring Ukraine receives the aid necessary to defend their nation. I'll bet President Putin wishes he had transportation and logistics experts just like you. Every day, I am humbled by and grateful for the professionalism and dedication displayed by the members of this association and the entire logistics enterprise. Without fail, we deliver for our nation. As an organization, Transcom recently celebrated our 35th anniversary. And after over three decades of operations, there is one constant. We must maintain our readiness to fight tonight while keeping a keen eye on our ability to do so into the future. Speaking of the future, Air Mobility Command recently cleared the KC-46 as a worldwide deployable weapon system, a critical step in integrating our newest tankers' advanced capabilities into the fight. And also thanks to the efforts of Navy, MARAD, and with support of Congress, we added two used roll-on, roll-off vessels into the Ready Reserve Fleet inventory to replace previously retired capacity. The Arundel and the Cortez are just the beginning of our efforts to recapitalize the surface fleet. Additionally, Transcom is preparing to assume the role as the department's single manager for global bulk fuel. Partnering with DLA's capability and experience, Transcom will focus on the synchronization of posture, planning, execution, and advocacy for resources to meet the energy needs of the joint force in a contested environment. We will need your innovative ideas and partnership to bolster our fuel distribution capability and reduce our risk, especially in the Pacific. But adapting together based on the strategic needs of our nation is nothing new for this association. From the collapse of the Soviet Union to Desert Storm, attacks on the homeland through natural disaster relief, sequestration, pandemics, supply chain congestion. I recognize that NDTA and the commercial industry have always been with us all the way. In fact, the first Transcom Commander, General Dwayne Cassidy, was keenly aware of our pivotal relationship that our command shares with NDTA and our commercial partners. In 1987, two days before Transcom's formal activation ceremony, General Cassidy addressed the members of NDTA. During a period of strategic competition with a former global power, he detailed the actions necessary for building a sophisticated logistics organization. An imperative Cassidy clearly identified was the need to develop a robust distribution system. A system that he described would revolutionize the logistics of our nation by providing the right information to those who will determine if we must fight, to those who will lead the fight, and when called, deliver those who must fight. So from our inception, the enterprise was created to provide our senior leaders decision space and deliver our nation's forces around the world in peace and war. Our incredible logistics network is the realization of General Cassidy's vision, and we have continuously evolved to maintain this strategic advantage for our nation. 
Even back then, he understood that achieving this goal was only possible through the special relationship between the military and transportation industry. He believed, as do I, that this relationship has been the underwriter of great change in industry and progress in our country. To an audience just like this one, he emphatically declared that Transcom will do great things. And over the 35 years since he delivered that speech, Transcom has undoubtedly accomplished incredible feats. And you've been with us all the way. And while I believe the capabilities inherent in our network exceeds even the foresight of General Cassidy, it's our resilient warfighting team members that continue to represent the, dif the difference between victory and defeat, and in many cases, between life and death. In December, Merchant Mariner Lieutenant J.G. Kelly Flynn was operating as a tactical advisor, or TACAD, on board the commercial vessel Marisk Perry, although it could have been any one of our commercial partners. Lieutenant Flynn was tasked with providing secure communications and training the crew on contested environments. While underway, Kelly's vessel received a distress call indicating that a boat had capsized nearby. Utilizing her experience and communications capabilities, she coordinated with international search and rescue agencies and relayed information to help the vessel navigate to the location. In the dead of night, the crew was first on scene where they located and rescued a distressed individual in the frigid waters of the Aegean Sea. Five hours later, the survivor was safely transferred to Greek search and rescue personnel. Unlike other forms of military power, logistics prowess presents the opportunity to achieve effects by saving lives. Lieutenant Flynn and the crew she served alongside highlight the value of all of our merchant mariners and partnerships with commercial industry. Now, Kelly couldn't join us because she's on some well-deserved leave. So instead, I would like all strategic sea lift officers, tech ads, and merchant mariners to stand and be recognized on her behalf. You are all a vital part of current and future operations. Current events, driven primarily by the acute threat posed by Russia, remind us that logistics is a critical warfighting function. Before Ukraine's sovereignty was violated, members of this association had already begun delivering the weapons and equipment that would directly impact events on the battlefield. Due to the expanse of our network, the opportunity to generate strategic results, though, is not limited to traditional members of the joint logistics enterprise. Helping to match the substantial ammunition requirements of the European theater with our significant capacity were two of our teammates from the Army's Joint Munitions Command. Over the past 10 months, Ms. Gina Ward and Mr. Patrick Bradley have coordinated over 2,800 Transportation Protective Service commercial trucks. These vehicles traveled from eight different munitions depots to four different Air Force airfields, where a mix of commercial and Air Mobility Command aircraft were waiting for upload. Their efforts helped demonstrate the agility of our network during the largest of 22 presidentially directed actions as we rapidly shifted departure locations from Tinker to Hill Air Force Base. At the height of this movement, the JMC team was managing around 40 trucks a day and coordinating with our other components to transport over 100,000 artillery rounds in 16 days. At SCDC's Military Ocean Terminal Sunny Point, Mr. Dave Temple led his team to synchronize additional truck and rail movements initiated by JMC. In North Carolina, the surface warriors oversaw the loading of over 2,000 containers and other combat equipment on commercial vessels bound for Europe. If you've heard of the ammunition and high Mars and the weapon systems utilized by Ukraine on the battlefield, these teams were part of the network that helped get them there. Individuals like Gina, Patrick, and Dave understand how to leverage the entire joint deployment and distribution enterprise from surface transport to airlift to sea lift, commercial and military. Knowing who you represent, I'd be honored if the three of you would stand and be recognized. Thank you all for the significant contributions you've made to our nation's success 
in the face of authoritarian aggression. In the last year, together, we once again demonstrated the impact a dedicated logistics organization can have on global operations. We did so in a manner much different than the preceding years, and with cargo to destinations not forecasted, and at a pace and scale no other organization could replicate. Our strategic success in Europe and the execution of our global enduring mission is the result of decades of deliberately developing our global posture and network, the application of our combined capacity, and the ability to command and control our forces with precision. And you were with us all the way. Take a look. The Russian military has begun a brutal assault on the people of Ukraine. Without provocation, without justification, without necessity, this is a premeditated attack. I spoke last night to President Zelensky of Ukraine, and I assured him that the United States, together with our allies and partners in Europe, will support the Ukrainian people as they defend their country. The nature of war is often unpredictable, but we are committed, shoulder to shoulder with Ukraine, to ensure they remain a free, independent, sovereign country. The Transcom team, from our components to our industry partners, underwrites the lethality of the Joint Force. Since our founding as a combatant command, every Transcom member, past, present, and future, has enabled the execution of our nation's strategic objectives. The nationwide baby formula shortage is reaching a critical state in some areas, but the Biden administration says help is on the way. We must be ready now and in the future. As a warfighting command, Transcom is focused on delivering the needs of the Joint Force regardless of the environment. Our fight tonight mentality drives us to evolve in the face of emerging challenges. Future success will depend on our logistics prowess. And turning now to the country of Pakistan that has been ravaged by incessant rains and floods since June. Whether we're supporting Ukraine's defense exercising capabilities around the world, or providing humanitarian assistance, our military and commercial partners continue to meet global strategic mobility requirements necessary to deliver troops, food, water, and hope, wherever and whenever. What you do matters, and I'm grateful for your service and commitment to our nation, because together we deliver. Come on now, well done. Help is on the way. Mm. Just as the original commander did all those years ago, I stand before the members of this association as our country once again engages in strategic global competition. This is not new territory for the men and women of this enterprise. Our strength is derived from the interconnection of our capabilities, the resilience of our global network, and the dedication of our people. This is the strategic advantage we must evolve and we need you with us all the way. The president's national security strategy makes it clear that China and Russia are working overtime to undermine democracy and export a model of governance marked by repression at home and coercion abroad. In their own ways, both seek to erode the legitimacy of established international norms and laws that have persisted for almost a century. Geopolitically, China remains our most consequential strategic competitor. Economically, 
They offer the promise of short-term monetary, technological, and even medical gains at the cost of a company or nation's long-term strategic decision space. They're overfishing in every sea and ocean around the world, imperils ecosystems and economies that so many countries depend on. And with their civilian fleets, they physically endanger our other mariners and inhibit freedom of movement in international waters. Daily in the cyber domain, they target our networks, probe our critical infrastructure servers, and seek to benefit from the intellectual properties of our civilian companies and military organizations. Militarily, they have studied our capabilities and are keenly aware of logistics' critical role in any future military action. To that end, they have custom designed their kinetic and non-kinetic capabilities to target our lines of communication. Holistically, China has shaped their instruments of national power to erode, disrupt, or destroy our ability to oppose their revisionist aspirations. And of course, we must contend with the underlying physics of the problem set. Across the vastness of the Pacific Ocean, the ability to generate and sustain operational momentum in compressed timelines to more destinations with limited capacity will be an imperative. With this in mind, to ensure Transcom remains ready now and in the future, earlier today, we released our command strategy that's focused on evolving our strategic advantage. Hopefully you've seen the, the QR codes out there on the business cards and the marquees, but just in case, to close the generational gap, all you gotta do is open up your camera, point it at the square, hit the button, okay? And don't worry, for those of you who prefer a hard copy, just stop by the Transcom booth. Regardless of the preferred medium, you'll find the command priorities are designed to meet the realities of the contested environment that we operate in and challenges we must address. To compete effectively, we must have agile, resistant, survivable, and sustainable logistics, all leading to delivering lethality. Undoubtedly, our enterprise will play an increasingly critical role in achieving our national defense objectives. To succeed, we must adopt the mentality that challenge is not synonymous with impossible and contested is not the same as impenetrable. Significant opportunities exist in this environment to exploit our expertise, to deploy, maneuver, and sustain the joint force. But to get there, we'll need you with us all the way. Future operations will not resemble recent successes, but they have demonstrated the importance of, an, of the national defense strategy's strategic ways of integrated deterrence, campaigning, and building enduring advantages. Our priorities and warfighting framework are fully aligned with these key concepts, and the capabilities we deliver will underwrite the lethality of the joint force. Integrated deterrence is predicated on making the adversary doubt that they can achieve their objective. This relies on Transcom's readiness to fight, deliver, and win through our global mobility posture. Strengthening and expanding relationships with our diplomatically aligned allies and partners is paramount in generating assured access, basing, and overflight. This requires a whole of government approach, including commercial industry efforts to solidify and amplify our established nodes and routes. These dense layers of contacts and contracts, military and commercial, are critical for our ability to set the globe. They also enable regional agreements that expand the availability of critical resources in remote locations, especially fuel. We must also be cognizant of the impacts that transnational issues, such as climate change and energy shortages, have on our readiness. Open dialogue, finding common ground built on trust, the trust of our shared values, is a strategic benefit that no com competitors can match. The collective influence of our enterprise and nation to shape the strategic environment provides us unrivaled positional advantage, senior leader decision space, and complicates the decision matrix of any potential adversary. But as the smartest guy I know, Mr. Bruce Bussler says, <laughs> that guy is so smart. We cannot posture our way out of the future fight. It's neither unlimited, guaranteed, or perfect. As a result, 
all of our available capacity, including emergency preparedness programs, must continue to represent a credible option for delivering fuel, munitions, personnel, and material, regardless of the environment. The complexities of distributed maneuver requires the total force, commercial, and ally and partner capacities to be employed in a dynamic manner. We have to be able to rapidly scale our combined global mobility capacity. We have to be able to make decisions at every echelon faster than our adversaries and ensure that we can deliver from the homeland to the last 1,000 tactical miles. To campaign effectively, we must continue to rehearse the concepts and capabilities necessary to aggregate forces to the fight and disaggregate to survive in degraded and denied environments. Through the globally, uh, globally Integrated Exercise, Pacific Century, Air Mobility Command's uh, Mobility Guardian 23, and other combined exercises, we will put a premium on closing operational gaps to strengthen deterrence and develop new concepts to prevail. We will work to increase our interoperability. This includes empowering our people and partners to develop skills and innovative solutions that will address the challenges of their particular operating environment. We will employ tack ads on commercial vessels, draw from prepositioned stocks, expand our console capability, seamlessly transload from commercial to military capacity, and utilize multimodal solutions to deliver across dispersed locations in compressed timelines. By doing so, we can identify technology and recapitalization requirements that will inform future joint force designs so we'll be capable of supporting future distributed operations. For decades, our logistics prowess has masked operational risk. We must grow our capabilities to ensure that logistics does not cause premature culmination on the battlefield. The timing, tempo, and scale of potential future operations necessitates that we focus on building enduring advantages, especially our ability to command and control logistics formations and integrate them into the joint force. To do so, we must begin by treating data as a strategic asset. Building on the lessons from Afghanistan and Ukraine, we've implemented tools like Advana and its recent transcom application, Pegasus. These are the first crucial steps in our utilization of advanced visualization, analytics, and machine learning capabilities to create decision advantage. Connecting advanced analytical tools with forecasted and real-time consumption rates to the available capacity will enable us to transition to push logistics, where we can preempt joint force needs while efficiently utilizing our resources. Our commercial military platforms uh, they will require integration into battle networks. They'll require advanced encrypted communication and reliable navigation. We must be linked into the distributed command and control constructs and resource with the tools that enable us to sense, make sense, decide and act faster. However, any digital advantage is untenable if it's not adequately trusted and protected. We must continue to drive cyber domain mission assurance from our platforms to our networks. No doubt, resilience in the cyber domain directly translates to agility in every other. In fact, last month we uh, completed our implementation of zero, our core uh, zero trust capabilities on our classified network, reaching the baseline maturity level. Our work is never done on this front and we will continue to advance this initiative, especially in the unclassified environment. But I want to take a moment to thank the efforts of the NDTA Cybersecurity Committee and industry, especially for your collaboration with our incredible cyber, uh, cyber mission assurance team led by Brigadier General Michelle, Michelle Hayworth. We are grateful that our relationship in this regard has only grown stronger. Only through secure, reliable, and agile command and control will be, we be able to apply our finite resources against joint requirements to maneuver at a pace and scale we have never seen before. The enduring advantages that we build today reinforce integrated deterrence and reduce the possibility of conflict. But to get there, we'll need you with us all the way. For over 78 years, this association has supported the growth and expansion of our nation's transportation infrastructure and the logistics networks that followed. 
in your history and in ours, we have always risen to meet the nation's strategic challenges. This has only been possible because we've recognized that the development of our people is inseparable from the growth of our organizations. Not fully understanding the impact of this most valuable resource has led to disaster for other governments, militaries, and companies. In the complexities of the decisive decade, we must continue to empower our competitive and resilient warfighting team. You are the ones who will ensure that we can compete now and into the future. This enterprise has always met difficulty with innovation, determination, and professionalism to deliver success. Time after time, when our nation called, we delivered. But what you've done and continue to do every day matters. But don't take my word for it. Those who have directly witnessed your impacts could explain it better than I ever could. Hello, everybody from Brussels, Belgium. I'm Chris Foley. I command U.S. European Command, and I'm the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. First, I'd like to thank General Manovos for the opportunity to speak to you today, because I am truly grateful for all the work that you do for this command. U.S. European Command depends heavily on reinforcement, and so you, the transportation enterprise and the Department of Defense, is critical to all of our plans and all of our operations. More than that, though, I'm responsible to deliver to the Alliance U.S. forces. So you are the people who do that. Not only are you supporting U.S. European Command every day, you're supporting the entire NATO alliance. And therefore, you're supporting the security of Europe and the United States of America. So thank you for everything that you do. Your professionalism, your dedication, and your unmatched capabilities are truly world class. My name is Alexandra Zarkina. I'm a Deputy Minister of the Ministry of Infrastructure. And I would like to say a few words for the work you're doing and the work we're doing all together. From the first days of this terrible war, my team was deeply engaged in the process of the international logistics. And from the half of the team and whole Ukrainian people, I wanted to thank the men and women of US Transcom, their components and all the commercial industry partners who have supported the defense and independence of Ukraine. The weapons, munitions and supplies you deliver to the people and our forces of Ukraine have saved countless lives. I just recently was in liberated Izum, Balaklia. Before I was in the Sumu region, myself I have a house in the future suburbs. And it's truly not much words needed to understand the value of the job you're doing. Because it's not about some processes, it's about the results and possibility to make a huge difference in this terrible war. I'm looking forward for the next deliveries, for the next cooperation projects, and really we're grateful. And we do hope to finish this war as soon as possible, to win this war, but to be even more connected than ever before. Slava Ukraini! Help is on the way. I'd like to leave you with one last thought from the founding commander of Transportation Command. As you reflected on the importance of this gathering of professionals and the capabilities we provide for our nation, he said, it's up to us to come up with new ideas. Ours is a nation dependent on transportation. We're realizing that fact now more than ever, and it's time for us to get on with it. Dwayne Scassi's words resonate just as much today as they did 35 years ago. Our time is now, the stakes are high, and success is only possible if you're with us all the way. Together we deliver. Okay, ladies.
and gentlemen. Uh, the generals uh, agreed to take a few questions and whatnot. Um, I, I'm kind of overwhelmed by what I just saw, but uh, I will. <laughs> you've got a great assembly here, ma'am, of logisticians, and I would, I would just say, or ask you, what, what one or two things would you consider as and when you think about contested logistics, et cetera, what do we need to be working on first? Or uh, or is there just a long list that yeah. we, we need to knock it all out? Um, can you talk yeah. about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, number one, we need to work on our will. This is going to be a different fight. We need to be thinking differently. You need to recognize that we won't have a lot of time. We need you to produce options. Bring your ideas forward, right? As a group, we'll, we'll know a heck of a lot more than a single person. And we're going to be operating at a speed and scale that we just haven't seen before. And our nation is counting on us. None of us want logistics to cause failure on the battlefield. That's what happened to Russia. We do not want to put ourselves in that position, but we can't do things the same way. We had some really good discussions this morning. We can't do some of our acquisition things the same way. We've got to you know, move out with alacrity uh, on some changes. You know, indeed, as I looked at uh, OAR and, 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 frankly, even Ukraine, some of our processes just don't scale. Right? Uh, so we've got to work on processes that can scale and transparency, planning together, right, so that we can be successful together, both with an immediate uh, a need tonight and into the future. So things, they're different, they're hard, change is hard. Uh, but the first thing is we recognize that we're in it, right? Slav and Ukraine, they're shoulder to shoulder with them. And look at, this is a logistics fight. You know, I think the team from OSD and, and, and the J4, they're here. Uh, and we're putting in lots of hours just to make sure that we can deliver. And you're doing it. You are coming up. We're not having to activate anything. You guys are bringing the capacity. Look, two-thirds of those flights that have gone into Ukraine, two-thirds of about 850, are commercial. We could not do that with our military capacity. We need to save military capacity for uniquely what the military needs to be. So it's really, it's, it's, it's will and attitudes. There are always it's developing people. I talked about in the speech, right? People are our number one resource. And you have to be oriented to the problem and know that you're in it. You're part of the team, right? That's, that's the number one thing. And then the innovative ideas will come because you recognize we can't do it the same way. We won't be able to build up that way or there's some new threat or some new thing. Your, your commercial organization's been taken out by cyber. What's the backup plan, right? It's not just, hey, let's take a week off and figure it out. We're going to need your capacity. So let's figure it out now, you know. So when we do these exercises, you know, a day without the AOC, a day without calm, a day without navigation, it's, it's to do that training, right? Our TAC ads, right, training uh, our mariners on how to operate in a contested environment, that's a thing. And so we need your help there. So bring your innovative ideas. Thanks, Ed. Okay, at this time, we've got some microphones in the aisles, and hopefully you're submitting questions. I'd, I'd see, ask down there, Ron, if we have any questions that you'd like to put forward to the general. Yes, sir, ma'am. We have a few questions coming in, and keep them coming. Don't be shy with the microphones. Uh, one question I have for you, ma'am. You mentioned the decisive decade. What's so special about this coming decade? And how can we as a team get ready for it? Yeah. Well, if you haven't heard, it's China, China, China. What's interesting about this decade is when we look at the, the autocratic regimes. Uh, we look at uh, Russia, obviously, what's going on in Russia right now. This is, this is tenuous. And we've not been in this space before. Right? So our professionalism matters. And, and every move we make, deterrence matters, how we do it together. Right? And that includes things like sanctions, which hurts you, driving up fuel, right? What are we willing to put up with so that we can show Russia they can't just roll into some territory and take it over and kill tens of thousands of civilians? Right? 
but it's painful for us because, you know, good cost of goods are going up and, you know, and add, just adds to our woes. And then I think about China right? and, and nefarious activities they've been part of. Right? We, can't, we have to hold people to account. You know, international norms should mean something. So because we're seeing this rise uh, of these two powers and what they're doing and the coercion that's occurring from an economic standpoint and the things I talked about, right, that, that's, that was unforeseen. I mean, maybe, maybe 20 years ago, some people were talking about it. We figured that uh, the more you integrate with a democracy, the better you would get and you'd follow international norms. That is not the case. Right? So there's a lot at stake in this decisive decade. And we talk about ensuring that we have the capability right now to see doubt in the mind of our adversaries that they will be successful in anything, whether that's China, uh, coercing their, their, their near neighbors or overfishing or it's DPRK and testing of, uh, testing of weapons. Right? So we have to band together now more than ever uh, across international with our allies and partners to ensure that we remain ready uh, into the future and we can stand for international law. It's, it's, it's that big. We have a couple of questions that uh, deal with cyber. Uh, one uh, talks about transparency and how it's it's critical to be transparent so we all know that we're on the same sheet of mu music logistically, but how do we do that with the uh, cyber threat that these near peer competitors bring to the fight? And a similar question, how do we need to change things like our AOCs? What does that look like in the future? Yeah, as much as uh, I want to throw this question to Michelle Hayworth and to Reba Sankis, I think Reba's here. Yeah, yeah. So, well, like last year, I was in command for 48 hours when I stood up here, and I and I did say I'm going to throw it to the folks in the front. Um, but uh, no, I'm not going to do that to you. On uh, on cyber attacks, right? Cyber protection. You know, we're we are trying to in these work groups, and again, thanks to Ted Rybick and the team for for the committee committee's work. I'm trying to bring us together to understand and to share, you know, share best practices, let you know what we're trying to do, hook you up with resources like at CISA uh, so that you understand what could be coming and, and what's the next steps for us to sort of share what has happened to each other. I know that's some maybe be a, a concerning topic, especially uh, when you're competitors in the commercial marketplace. But in the end, you know, our, our adversaries are, they're really not interested in, in our competition. They're just interested in ensuring that you cannot mobilize the force and we cannot deploy the force forward. Because once we deploy the force forward, they know they're in trouble. So they don't care what company you are. They're, they know how we, they've watched us. They know how we, how we mobilize and deploy and they're gonna go after anybody's system that they can to, to, to uh, delay, uh, degrade, or deny our ability to do that. So it behooves us to work together to the maximum extent possible to share the threats when you're being attacked, to, to work with CISA and to share that threat amongst other users, even if it's anonymous, so that other people, to include the government, can learn from who is probing your networks uh, and who's getting after, uh, you know, who is, means harm uh, to us. It's very helpful for us to know and share that. So I think you see on the intelligence side that we'll share more and more, and I think that's where we need to go, but that requires trust. Uh, between everyone that requires you know, security clearances and trust, uh, that we're not going to uh, steal the secrets of a company and that uh, we're going to be honest about, about the level of attack and what it means to our nation. Uh, and geez, I don't know what it means to the AOC, uh, but uh, I, I do know that when we did a day without the AOC, it was not a great day. Uh, so this is about assured command and control and in having encrypted communications, which is what we're trying to do. Not all our assets have that. We're trying to do carry-on kits for encrypted uh, communications so we can maintain uh, uh, C2 over assets around the world. And we have to, it has to be resilient as well, right? If they take out a certain satellite or a certain bandwidth, we need to be able to use something else, whether it's line of sight or beyond line of sight, so that we can maintain uh, that connection. Because the name of the game will be recovering from disruption. 
Now, you may see it in your supply chain, you can see it in your operations and daily, but we have to be able to recover from disruption. That requires that, that, that secure C2. And, and likely this will be um, at echelon, or distributed C2 capabilities that we'll have forward uh, in case you lose connection with the AOC, in this case, uh, on the air side. So we have to think through those constructs and make them available to our commercial partners so that they understand and can provide the feedback on how that would work should they lose C2. Great question. And in your presentation, you mentioned about new ideas, or that it's time to get on with it. Well, how do we all, with all of our organizations, change the risk calculus with our people so they will take those risks and be innovative rather than just stuck where we are? Yeah, the age-old question on change management. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm a huge Simon Sinek fan. Start with why. You know, and ask yourself deep down why. Why are we doing it? What does it mean? What does it mean to me? And in the end, that's why I got down to international law, right? And our democracy. If you keep asking why, it's going to delve to that, to what it really means to be an American citizen and to have the freedoms that we have here, right? So uh, this is a, it's an imperative that, that we uh, are part of an international system that works together to preserve international law, right? If that starts to erode, then we think about legal legal challenges and you know every issues companies operating overseas, right? All of that starts to crumble, right? And then and then we're just in a cat fight, right? So it's super important that that you link your mission. So we start with at your formations down, you know, your flight level and your your office level, and and down into the operations area. What you do matters, you know. It's, you know, Slava Ukraine. Right? What you're doing, you're working late, you're coming up with new ideas to move very hazardous equipment, or getting, you know, ensuring that the truck drivers are safe and moving all that hazardous, we've not moved that much stuff and that, and that, that kind of pace, you know, maybe since World War II. Uh, so, you know, getting, not you know, looking, taking the risk, what is a, dis a disciplined risk taking? What are you allowing, what are you empowering your subordinates to do within discipline risk taking, right? Discipline meaning you've thought through what the second order effects could be, you've had that discussion, you're willing to take the risk. Because the, the, the risk of uh, staying the same is worse than the risk of changing. As I said, we some of our systems don't scale, uh, and, and our ability to keep a pace of the logistics flow, it's not guaranteed. So what are we gonna do to guarantee that? And that's when we come into, we need your ideas. You're the ones that are out there in the Pacific. You're the ones that are out there at these nodes. Uh, you see what's going on. You're looking at the cyber uh, protection capabilities of your companies, right? It's really, really important uh, that you think through what it means to your company, not just for the bottom line, but your ability to serve your nation in whatever it is your company does, right? That's what's at risk. Yeah. Thanks. And, uh, we give, on behalf, yeah. due to your, I'm speaking in your microphone, we, we pick four charities and we'll make a donation to those charities in, uh, in your name, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very you. much.